We love talking about hot stocks here on the channel, but what about the stocks you can buy and know they'll produce solid returns for decades? How do you find those forever stocks you can buy and just sit back and collect the checks? In this video, I'll reveal three factors I look for when buying stocks for the long term and five stocks you can buy right now. We're talking best investments to make money today on Let's Talk Money. Beat day. Make money. Make your money work for Creating you. Creating the financial future you deserve. Let's Talk Money. Joseph Hogue with the Let's Talk Money channel here on YouTube. I want to send a special shout out to everyone in the community. Thank you for taking a part of your day to be here. If you're not part of that community yet, just click that little red subscribe button. It's free and you'll never miss an episode. I love to buy deep value stocks and benefit from that near term rebound. A perfect example is the Haynes brand position on our 2019 stock market challenge. I saw rising online sales and strength in that active wear segment ahead of a 52% surge in the shares. But you also need to be investing for the long term, right? We want to be building a portfolio that's going to benefit from those quick wins, but one where our stocks are going to withstand the test of time. Fortunately, there is a way to get both. Get that short term pop plus the long term returns that are going to beat your investing goals, or as I call them, forever stocks. That's exactly what we're going to be doing today. In this video, I'm going to show you three factors I look for when picking stocks to buy for the long term. I'll cover each factor, then I'm going to reveal five stocks to buy right now that I think could produce double digit returns over the next 30 years. The first factor I'm looking for in forever stocks is a dividend yield, and there's going to be a few reasons for that. First is that stocks that pay dividends just tend to do better than the rest of the market. Now, this graphic is a little jumbled, but groups of stocks paying dividends and those with a history of growing their dividends are the blue lines at the top, while no dividend stocks and those cutting their cash payouts are the two bottom lines. The research this was based on has been sliced and diced every way, but the simple truth is that dividend paying companies beat the market. One of the reasons for this is because that dividend payout acts as cash discipline on management. It's harder to spend on those questionable projects if you know you've got to meet that $400 million dividend payment at the end of the quarter. That dividend payment is like having some of your paycheck automatically invested instead of it just sitting in your checking account tempting you to spend on whatever commercial you see next. If you don't have that money sitting around, you're less likely to spend it on some stupid crap you don't need. It's the same way with management. Another reason why I want to be investing in dividend stocks is because it's always a positive return. This chart shows the percentage of return from dividends and price appreciation in each decade. Now, dividends might be a small part of your return when the market's booming like in the 90s, but when the stock market crashes, that dividend return may be all you collect. 30 years is a lot of bear markets, and so having those dividend stocks is going to be a lot of protection. Now, when I'm looking for dividend stocks, I want a company paying a yield of at least 2%. That's the average dividend yield on the S&P 500, so I like to look for stocks paying maybe a little above the average. I also want to look at the payout ratio, though, and this is something that we've talked about before. The payout ratio is the percentage of profits paid out to cover the dividend. Now, I like to see a payout ratio of 60% or less so I know the company is keeping enough money back for growth as well as making those cash payments. So obviously you know I'm all about dividend stocks but there's another side of investing. Looking at companies with the fastest growth. Now Think names like Tesla, Netflix and Amazon. This growth investing can be just as profitable or more than dividend investing so I need your opinion on this one. Which do you want to see more videos about, dividends or growth investing? Just scroll down below the video and let me know in the comments. The second factor I'm looking for in these long term stocks to buy is going to be to take advantage of those big macro trends. Now this means finding companies that are going to benefit from those large universal trends like aging populations, food demand and automation. We're talking the massive unstoppable forces that are going to unfold over decades. This kind of long term investing is the best thing you can do for your portfolio and really how some of these hedge fund managers like Seth Klarman made their billions. This is one of my favorite ways to invest because it makes it investing so easy. You're looking at these big trends and thinking, OK, which sectors or industries of the economy are going to benefit? Now, those forces are going to drive demand for every company in that sector and industry. So, so once you answer that question, you just look for the leaders in the group. The best part is you don't have to pick that one best company because all the players in that group are going to benefit from these massive shifts. Now, some of the biggest macro trends I'm watching include aging populations. So the fact that 10,000 Americans are reaching retirement age every single day, that's going to affect everything from government services to consumer spending. Food demand. So global agricultural production just isn't keeping up with demand. Obviously, automation and artificial intelligence are going to bring huge shifts in work and other areas. Big data and especially with the coming of 5G networks, I think it's going to bring a wave of changes. 
Finally, the shift in economic and political strength to Asia. And here we're not just talking about China, which is obviously the big one, but also India and other parts of the region. The third factor I'm looking for in this long-term stocks theme is going to be just as important, and that's companies safe from the destruction in these macro trends. Just as a lot of opportunities are created from these massive trends, there's also going to be that creative destruction that's the hallmark of capitalism. With this one, think of entire industries like newspapers and magazines. Think of once hugely successful companies like Kodak that, while it did survive, it's hard to argue that the company is the giant it used to be. So here I'm thinking about industries at risk from automation and AI. We're not just talking about making the industry obsolete, but the kind of change that's going to be hard for companies to keep up with. There will always be a need for banking, but the evolution in online banking, peer-to-peer -peer lending, and even digital currencies is making it very difficult for banks to keep up. You could have a best-of-breed bank, uh, but if they aren't able to constantly adapt to these changes, it's not going to last those 30 years. I'm also looking at companies at risk to big regulatory concerns and what I'll call death by Amazon. So here I want to stay away from pharmacy retail and drug makers, not because I think those industries won't be around, but because these big risks are evolving so quickly that a lot of companies just aren't going to be able to keep up. So those three factors are guiding my long-term investments, but of course I'm still doing that deep fundamental analysis when I pick stocks. I'm looking at the cash flows and profitability like we've talked about in these other videos and finding companies with a distinct advantage over competitors. I know it's a lot, but nobody said finding the best stocks for the next 30 years would be easy. Now I'm going to reveal the five names that I think could make the cut. Some of these are going to be pretty safe bets while others could be a little more risky. First though, if you're liking the video and thinking it might help you be a better investor, do me a favor and tap the thumbs up button below or just let me know in the comments. Our first stock is an anchor for a lot of portfolios, Campbell's Soup or ticker CPB. The $10 billion leader in packaged foods controls 60% of the canned soup market and a strong position in snacks and beverages. That kind of market share and size gives it negotiating power against retailers in shelf space and pricing. Now, Management has made some missteps over the last couple of years, but has also been a victim of some bad economics in food packaging. Food costs have been rising at around 3% annually, but companies just haven't been able to pass those increases on to customers, so profitability has suffered. Shares have fallen about 45% since mid-2016, but represent some great value right now. Management has already driven $550 million in cost savings and expects another $400 million through 2022, which should rekindle some of that profitability. They're also expecting to announce buyers for the International Business and Bull House Farms Fresh segment by the end of the year. The two segments represent about $2.1 billion in revenue, so I'm modeling about $4 billion from buyers that will significantly help pay down some of that debt that's acting as an overhang on the shares. Now, earnings are expected 0.8% lower over the next four quarters, but the company has a strong history of beating expectations. I'm forecasting 255 in earnings per share on stronger profitability, which would put the shares right around 14 times on a price to earnings basis. The shares trade at just 1.1 times sales, which is about 40% discount to the five year average, almost half the two times average price to sales multiple for the industry, so some really good value here. Besides that great valuation, solid dividend, and just the strength of the company's business, I love Campbell's here for a potential catalyst. Now, Activist Hedge Fund Third Point has been battling the company for years to unlock that shareholder value and take control from the Dorrance family. The hedge fund owns about 7% of the shares and finally won an agreement last November to add two of its nominees to the board of directors. That means shareholders have a strong voice on the board that's expert in increasing value. The hedge fund has said everything is on the table, including a break up the company or asset sales to unlock that value, and investors get a 3.9% dividend while they wait. So I like Campbell's here, but you're thinking, mm, I just don't see soup as a growth market that's going to jump over the next 30 years. What else you got for me? China Mobile, ticker CHL, hits our list of stocks to buy for the long term next. So just about every U.S. company has a China plan to break into some part of the world's second largest economy. Even though the U.S. economy is about twice as big, China's economy is adding almost twice the value to its, to its economy every year because it's growing so fast. Getting exposure to that growth through U.S. companies with sales in China just isn't enough. Every single investor needs to own some Chinese domestic stocks and China Mobile is one of my top picks. The telecom company controls 61% of the 4G market and 60% of the total wireless market. 
with 916 million subscribers. It's the largest telecom in the world. And despite this ginormous size already, it's still post posting some astonishing growth. Now, China Mobile also became the country's largest fixed broadband provider last year, controlling 42% of the market and accounting for 73% of all new broadband customers versus those other two telecoms, China Unicom and China Telecom. China is determined to be the leader in 5G. It's said so publicly, and this is one of the first tech evolutions where it really has a chance to set the pace. It's going to do it. That's going to open up a lot of opportunity for these telecoms and the broader economy. Now, IoT smart connections among corporate clients increased 154% in the first half of last year to 384 million. That's already more than the entire population of the United States. Behind all this growth is also one of the strongest balance sheets I've ever seen with 70 billion in cash. That's more than 30% of the company's stock market value. For comparison, Apple's cash stockpile is less than 10% of its market cap, and China Mobile is generating over $7.6 in free cash flow every year. Shares pay a 3.9% dividend yield, and the company pays out just 48% of profits to the dividend, which is solid but still obviously leaves a lot of money for growth. At a price to sales ratio of two times, which is just under the 2.15 times average over the last five years, the shares aren't a bargain here, but the long term potential is undisputed. Now, there is one major drawback to China Mobile the controlling ownership by the Chinese government. As the controlling shareholder and the regulator of all three domestic telecom operators, the government is a limiting force on how powerful any one company can become. In fact, over the last decade, it swapped out the CEOs of the companies twice to try to distribute those management experience and knowledge. The upside to all this is that the Chinese market will continue to grow and the government wouldn't consider letting anyone else play behind, beyond these three established companies. So you basically have an implicit guarantee for China Mobile. Now, ConAgra Foods, ticker CAG, is one I added to the 2019 dividend portfolio in February. The company is a US powerhouse in prepared meals where it's the second largest in the industry. It has a 40% market share in canned tomatoes and more than a fifth of the meat snacks market with its Slim Jim product. The company has some solid brands in that relatively safer consumer staple sector, so, so we're talking dividends as well as a recession-proof industry. Now, management fumbled big time with last year's Pinnacle acquisition and had to lower the profit outlook by 20% late last year. The problems were centered around Pin Pinnacle's distribution business, so a little harder to read, but management has been very transparent since December about its plans going forward. I think they're being overly conservative on estimates for a 5% sales decline and margin loss on the Pinnacle assets, so the next surprise could be on the upside when things come out better than expected. Despite those missteps, the Pinnacle deal still brought a lot of opportunity to the company with a position in those faster growing frozen food space. Consumer data is showing that millennials are adopting frozen meals at a higher rate than previous generations, and it's hard to imagine a tech shift that could put this industry in jeopardy. Shares of ConAgra pay a 3.9% dividend, which management has affirmed with its new 2019 outlook and trade for just 9.9 .9 times trailing earnings. That's a 41% discount to the price multiple where it was trading at just last November. Now, cash flow is still solid and management is expecting a $215 million in cost savings through 2022 on that acquisition. The average analyst price target on this one is 50% higher than the current price, and even the lowest price target is 8% higher. Next, we have the Vanguard Real Estate ETF, ticker VNQ, which is probably my favorite exchange-traded fund and another one in our 2019 challenge portfolio. It holds shares of 187 real estate companies spread across all property types and across the United States. Now, everyone in the community knows I'm a huge believer in real estate. I got my first professional job as a commercial property analyst while in college. I've managed my own rental properties and have seen real estate create more fortunes than any other asset. Real estate is truly a generational wealth builder and will always be in demand. Now, the fund pays a 4.2% dividend yield and has returned 14.7% annually over the last decade. Beyond that solid cash yield in return, this is a great opportunity to take a little risk off the stock market and have it in a real physical asset like property. The fund has been under pressure over the last couple of years because of those rising interest rates. Now, obviously, with the leverage used in real estate, anytime you have rising rates, that's going to weigh on returns. But the Fed has signaled no more rate hikes this year, and that could unleash a lot of value in this stock. So we saw the real estate fund in blue here outperforming stocks through 2017 when the rates started heading higher. Uh, looking more recently with that market crash last year, and we're seeing real estate outperform again. Now, I know I said I wanted to stay away from those pharmaceutical stocks because of the potential for regulatory problems over drug prices, but I think Cardinal Health ticker CAH deserves a spot on the list. The $15 billion leader in medical supplies and pharmaceutical distribution to hospitals and pharmacies is diversified enough, I think it can withstand some of that regulatory risk. 
Now, the biggest reason I'd overlook that risk of problems with drug pricing is the company's position in one of the biggest and surest demographic trends, that aging population. The very middle of the baby boomer generation, those born in 1955, turned 64 years old this year. That still puts a tidal wave of people over the next two decades that are going to be increasing the demand for healthcare. Between Amerisource Bergen, Cardinal Health, and McKesson, these three companies control 90% of the pharmaceutical wholesale market in the country. Even if we do see some true enthusiasm for drug price controls from the government, which is a long shot to start with, I think it's likely the industry can negotiate a compromise that still maintains solid profits while moderating price increases. Management has identified over $300 million in cost savings it can drive this year and next, which, which could rocket free cash flow. Shares pay a 3.8% dividend yield, and the payout has grown at an 8% annualized clip over the last five years. Analysts are only expecting a 2.4% earnings growth to 510 per share over the next year, but the company has a great history of thrashing expectations. Over the last two years, management has surprised on the upside by 14% over expectations, with even stronger results lately. Even the estimates, though, put the shares at just 10 times earnings, so definitely some good value in this one. Now, if you want to see the rest of the stocks in our 2019 dividend portfolio, I'm linking to it in the video description below, and I'll put a clickable card in the corner of this video. It's got some great long-term stocks to buy for both dividends and that deep value. The portfolio is already up over 20% on the year and about two times the return on the overall stock market. We're here Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays with the best videos on beating debt, making more money, and making your money work for you. If you've got a question about money, just subscribe to the channel and ask it in the comments below. We'll make sure you get an answer in a future video.